So it's been one year since Crazy Rich Asians um, in Asian August. And actually, almost exactly one year ago, Asian Google Network brought John M. Chu and Henry Golding from Crazy Rich Asians to Google. So I'm actually very curious, Kevin. Can you speak to your thoughts on how Crazy Rich Asians has impacted the role of Asians and Asian male in, in entertainment? Yeah, I think Crazy Rich Asians was a great jump off and starting point for not just Asian males, but Asians in general. It created, a, it created a big wave of opportunity from people in the industry that I know of. Um, our stories are being heard now. It seemed to have been proven with the American dollar and the dollar that we wanna see our stories. Because before that, we didn't really have much, right? And so I've seen in my own career where I've been given opportunities now in not just modeling, but TV stuff or YouTube or like even being here because of something like that. Because before Crazy Rich Asians, I'm telling you, it was like silence. It's like I had to be screaming and knocking on the doors of people to try to get my foot in the door or an opportunity or anything. And now it just seems to be like, oh, we want you to come here. Oh, can you do this? Can you collaborate with this person? Um, and it really just shed so much more opportunity that I can't even describe because it was just like all of a sudden it was like, well, why didn't you see us before? You know what I mean? This movie. Why, why did it take something like this to have it happen? But it's happened. And it's, it's definitely uh, impacted not just uh, entertainment, but also fitness and uh, social media influencing all of that. That's awesome. So you also have your own movie that came out. So let's talk your documentary. So first of all, who here has watched The Ugly Model? Awesome. Shame on you. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so please watch it after this talk. But I'd like to le learn a little bit more about how this actually came about. Sure. Uh, the Ugly Model came because uh, I think it was like three or four years ago. I was still living in Philadelphia. And um, I was just getting into my identity and hanging out with the Asian culture in Philadelphia, uh, not the Asian culture, the Asian community in Philadelphia. And my friend had this, pro uh, not project, it was a Q&A with Jeremy Lin at a basketball game. And she said, you should come, you know, you should talk to him because you're all about Asian men and their identity. And he's a perfect role model. And I was like, yeah, but I got a, I got a date. <laughs> priorities that you know I was like really decided like should I go on this date with somebody that I actually never met yet you know but it was like or should I go meet Jeremy Lin and I can make use of this and to meet like an icon and a role model um, and ask him about Asian identity because I know for me people would look at me and be like oh he's a model he's fitness guy like his last name's Kreider he probably doesn't face any of these discriminations or feel the way an Asian guy does and I'm like well if I do I wonder if somebody like him does or has seen it or experienced it. And will he actually speak up and voice it more? Um, so then I decided to go there and I did a video and I had my friend Erica uh, video tape it. Um, I didn't know where it was going, but I was like, oh, I have a YouTube channel. Let me just put it on there and see what happens. And so when I asked him the question about like Asian men not being sexy um, or seen as masculine or attractive, and then his response just like, took off and this is before Crazy Rich Asians came out and then all of a sudden things started to happen for me there then all of a sudden um, in the Korean adopted space the producer Bianca is also uh, a Korean adoptee she came to Philadelphia just coincidentally and I told her about uh, this video that I did and she's like oh yeah I saw you uh, I have a friend who's also a director and she's looking for a new movie I think this would be a great subject to do and I was like, wow, yeah, I never never thought about making a movie out of it or something. Um, and so she's like, yeah, you could be like the main character and we'd follow you and these people that you've met in your life and uh, share your story of the Asian male identity. And so I personally was a little hesitant because um, I think it's a big responsibility in a sense because I, I want the message to be right. And I want the story to be something that Asian men can be proud of. And so, and then people like, you know, we asked Jeremy, we asked my friend Guy, uh, Guy Tang to be in it. Um, 
Brian Yang and all these people. And it's like, you know, we're putting these people on the line. Like, I, I hope it's something that they can be proud of, too. And the message is there, too. So that's how it really came in the line, just by going on a date or meet Jeremy. <laughs> and really, at that time, it seems like an easy question to answer right now. But at that time, I was really debating it, you know. But I realized it was like, okay, there's this once-in-a-lifetime chance. And to tell you the truth, it really was because now he's, like, going to China, right, to play basketball. I wouldn't probably have that opportunity again. You got a lot of comments on that YouTube video that you posted. What was the most surprising one? Oh, man. The, it was repetitive with the the surprising comments of, like, even um, not just Asian men saying they felt that way. I think what was most surprising was that it was all types of minorities feeling that way. Even though I wasn't sharing from the... Uh, like the black identity, LGBTQ, whatever, or, or female, right? Like they, it was the same experience and same feelings that we were going through. And that was the most surprising because I really thought I'd get only Asian guys caring about this or saying things, you know? And to hear that even Asian women were like, wow, I didn't think somebody was telling my story. I was like, wow, this is cool. Like this is, this is a bigger topic than just Asian male identity too. And I thought that was the most surprising for me. Super cool. So after the film came out, how has how have things changed for you personally, professionally? The ugly model, right? Yes, the ugly model. So a little bit of a personal information. Well, it's not personal anymore. I'm going to air it. <laughs> but my, um, a side of my family didn't really understand it because um, I'm adopted and they're white. And uh, uh, it was actually really my more my mom's side. And um, she was just like, no, I just, I don't see it. I don't think that. And it was like one of these things where she said, she's like, I don't agree with what you're doing or saying, but I, I support you and I love you. And then when she saw the documentary, everything changed. I think it's because she saw how many people were affected by it and how many people could relate to it. And then she saw all of that on the big screen that she's like, oh man, it's not just Kevin. It's not all in his head, right? It's not something that you just get over on your own. And I think that was a huge thing that if it could change her, even though she's my mom, um, I feel like it could change a lot of people. And so that, that changes my own personal family dynamics alone. Some other things that change is that all of a sudden, a lot of Asian entrepreneurs from all different fields I'm like reaching out to or they're reaching out to me we're collaborating we're coming up with ideas to get the messages out or like do talks or like do these types of things and it's just unbelievable the collaboration and the um the the, the willingness to actually help each other out whether you're in entertainment or you're in education or you're in tech just to help each other out it's just unbelievable the support we're getting now that's awesome. So talk more about that, the support across the different industries. So we're here, yeah. obviously, all working in tech, working at Google. So this film empowers Asian men. Yes. What are some transferable takeaways for all of us here in the audience and also in the live stream? Yeah, so a lot of the, just because you're, I mean, like, look, the stereotype, right, is for Asian guys to be smart, right? A lot of tech people, right? And that's the thing. It's pretty awesome. I mean, you guys work at Google. You guys are making crap happen, right? Stuff happen in the world. Uh, I think the major takeaway, though, is that you could actually jump off off of that because you have a great opportunity. You work at Google. You know, you have a voice. People, I mean, for me, I don't even work at Google. But when I hear somebody works at Google, I'm like, oh, so I'm like, yes, what do you have to say? Like, what, you know, you're a person of authority, whether you realize it to, like, people... And I know there's like 100,000 people that work here, but it's still like, it's, it's pretty amazing. And I don't, I know nothing about tech. But what I was gonna say is a lot of people feel like they might be stuck at their jobs or they or are they doing the wrong thing. And I say, no, you're really doing the right thing. Like my thing is I've met so many people who took the stereotypical route, like finance or tech, but they're doing amazing stuff. They're doing, they're like backing up projects. They're going to speak. They're going to collaborate with people. They're helping people. They're funding. They're, they're elevating. They're creating their own organizations, right? Um, for instance, somebody in tech, 
Byung, he's like an associate producer of the documentary and he's been nothing but supportive to help get this message and this movie out here. He didn't quit his job, you know, but he's doing something in addition to helping out the cause and a belief that we have and getting the message out there and representing right. And he's not just, uh, he's taking action. You know, people, you have a chance to actually take action. You know, um, you li you pretty secure and comfy here at Google, right? I mean, I heard, you know, like apparently putting coffee in your own cup is like kind of a big deal. You're like, oh, somebody doesn't make it, you know? <laughs> I'm like, you guys are living pretty comfy. Use that comfort to actually go out and do something good for what you say you believe in then because you have that opportunity. Uh, somebody like me, it's a little bit harder, you know, because like I do a lot of this and I don't have that comfort. I'm more entrepreneurial in the sense of like, I don't have a nine to five. I don't have, I have my own business and brand and stuff. So I don't have that ability to like consistently have money to like fund in projects that really need it. You know, um, so for instance, a friend of mine, uh, uh, a couple of them started Gold, Gold House. I don't know if you guys know what Gold House is, uh, but they came from like, engineer and tech backgrounds and they super succeeded and they're still working but they're also a part of a nonprofit that helps get these movies and these media changing and to also help asian men get real leads in movies and fun movies like that and help the success of the movies coming out so not only can you like just go out and do the movies you could also i don't work for gold house but i know a lot of people will also help fund the tickets and help uh, the nonprofits to help get um, movies like Crazy Rich Asians, Searching, Always Be My Maybe out there. Uh, they've been working on projects like that and you can, you can help out. You have the ability and power to. Uh, and that's where I just feel like the opportunity is for all of us to, to help out in that way. I think Asian Google Network's done a great job by bringing different folks across different industries. Absolutely. So recently we had a food-related talk with all Asian entrepreneurs. And of course, we have you here today. So we hope to have more of those conversations. But I do know that a lot of folks I've spoken to at Google, they want to get more insights on how they can actually get involved. We hear about all these things, we come out and we support, but some people want to do more. So yeah. do you have any tips for us? How do we get more involved with everything you just mentioned. Yeah, I mean, you can get involved. It's a simple conversation with somebody, right? Uh, I think the biggest thing that we're missing is more like mentorship, actually, especially for the younger generation. Um, I know some people don't, especially some guys, it might be scary to talk about your vulnerabilities, your insecurities about being Asian um, or feeling inferior or insecure about it. And the thing is, even though you might be over it, you could help somebody who was in that position that is still there right now. And I think that's what we, at least I find myself and other people getting sh short-sighted is that there's other people that need your help. And just because you feel good about yourself and empowered doesn't mean other people don't. And I just feel like sometimes we forget that and we need to mentor others that are, that are um, in that same position that we were. So that's the simplest and easiest. It takes nothing from you. It doesn't cost anything. It just takes some of your time and wisdom. Uh, share that. Um, other things you can do is actually show up to good stuff, right? What I mean by that is, show up to a movie that looks really good that is produced by Asians or has an Asian male lead, right? Or has your favorite Asian actress or actor in it. Um, and, and really, really go there and voice it. And the thing that I hate to see, though, is for you to just show up to a movie just because it's all Asians, though. It's got to be good, you know? I've talked to some directors who, sorry, but like it was pretty crappy, some of the movies. And they're like, why, you need to show up. And they're like talking to us, like, you need to show up and buy. But I'm like, yeah, but you gotta make it good. <laughs> you know, like, I'm not gonna sit through this boring movie, like, and promote it and it's no good, you know? It's gotta be really good and we gotta put our best faces out there. Um, for instance, there's a movie, and I'm not promoting it, but it's just like this movie searching. John Cho, phenomenal. So have no clue why it didn't really get this box office smash the way I believe it deserved. But um, here I am sharing about it now. So maybe you'll go see it, right? It's a very good movie. There's some other ones that I'm not going to talk about that I thought were crappy, but I'm just not going to talk about it. 
So that's the way to go for me. Um, because this is going out to a lot of people, so I don't want to that detriment like a good movement, you know, because it is good that what they're doing. I don't see the, uh, I see the benefit from having movies no matter what in it. Um, so you can do that. Uh, other people are funding independent movies too. You know, like I said, associate producer helped out with funding and promoting it. I mean, he was doing some, Beyond was doing some of the groundwork, like literally going out there in the film festivals and handing flyers out. I hate to sound like this. I don't know too many people who have like the humility to do that. Some people think oh, I'm too good to do that. You know, I'm a producer. This is for somebody else. It's like, no, we need people to do that. Volunteer. I know people who volunteer to help out. You know, um, this is volunteering, right? So volunteer your time if you can. Great tips. So this, I like to switch gears a little bit and talk about mental health. So in The Ugly Model, you went through some issues when you had alopecia and you actually skateboarded from LA to New York. I just put a, a wig on. No, I'm kidding, it's not wig. <laughs> it looks very real. Um, so I think for a lot of Asians growing up, mental health was a very bit of a taboo subject. Mm -hmm. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, um, yeah. sharing a little bit about your perspective, what you went through. Was that the eat, pray, love journey that you were hoping for? Yeah. What were your takeaways from that experience? So I'll try to answer all four of those. <laughs> it was not the eat, pray, love experience that I, I had hoped for. Even going to Bali was not the eat, pray, love experience I had prayed for. Uh, and mental health is a huge, huge thing for me because uh, even when I lost my hair from alopecia areata, you know, I was still having the modeling career. I was still fit. I, I had a full head of hair and I was super inside anxious, anxiety feel like pissed off, you know, about everything. Cause like, you know, internalized self-hatred and not having a voice and being marginalized for everything and telling everything's in my head, but I didn't think I was crazy, you know, but then it led me to being crazy a little bit. And then when you have nobody to talk to or understand or relate to, you feel even lonelier. And you know, they're finding that loneliness and isolation is just as deadly as like cancer. Or well, I mean, smoking that causes cancer. It's just as bad as that. So no wonder I went crazy, you know? And I think a lot of people think mental health is just as easy as by saying, let it go. And I'm like, it's not that easy. Well, how? You just let it go. Take a yoga class. And it's not that simple. You know, I took a lot. I was only doing yoga when I lost my hair. So if I were to like attribute mental health, I'd be like, yoga makes you crazy. You know, you'll lose your hair. But that wasn't it. It was like all in here. But nobody, nobody taught me um, anything about mental health. And I, the stigmatism around it made me even not want to talk about it even more. And so I know in the Asian community, Speaking about mental health is, is a faux pas, which is French. So let me bring it back to English. It's not allowed. It's seen as something like weak. You're seen as weak if you have a mental health issue or it's a, it's a problem that you need to put on your, solve on your own. Don't, don't mess my vibe, you know? And I just feel like that's something that's very detrimental to the Asian community because we do have mental health issues happening. I mean, it's just a fact, like awareness is going to be the number one thing to help out with this. And then to have role models speak about mental health and make it normalized is the next best thing. To normalize mental health is actually the next best thing instead of trying to hide it. And the only way you can really do that is if you can share your own story. And that's what I found is the best way to help other people with mental health is just to share my own personalized story going through it and to help other people relate to it and get their, their strength from it and um, from your own personal experience and your journey. Um, and so that's what I've been doing and it's only helped me um, share my own story. It's helped me, it's helped a lot of people I find. So I think mental health is definitely something, is the new wave, right, of, of just health in general. There was another part of that question that I think I might have missed. What was? The the actual skateboarding journey. The actual skateboarding journey, I do not recommend it to anybody. Because <laughs> first you got to know how to skateboard. That sucked. <laughs> and then you seriously just have to have really absolutely nothing going on in your life 
to be able to do that because I literally had nothing going on in my life. And I was just like, what is the next best thing that I can do? I was hoping for this, like you said, eat, pray, love experience that never came. Um, those that saw the documentary, I really thought something magical would happen, something cinematic or right. And I'd be okay with either one. I really was. And, um, yeah, the worst thing that happened was I came back to Philadelphia with nothing, you know, with my dad kicking me out of the house. And so that's not an eat, pray, love story. <laughs> you know, that's it's more like a rock bottom story, I guess. And, uh, I didn't know that's where it was leading tell you the truth. I thought it was going to lead to something really great and for me to self-discover about myself. But then I realized all this physical activity, I was really just kind of using that because that's what I've, I've done best my whole life. But I was avoiding what was going on here, what was going on in here. And instead, it's just like, just sit still, stay where you are, work this thing out. You know, And that was actually the best thing for me. So I'm not saying... I would never do that again because it led me to like budge. If I can't even, if I can skateboard across the country and I still feel crappy about myself, what am I going to do? <laughs> like well, I've tried everything, you know, but I, tr I tried everything except for this, just sitting still with myself and really dealing with my insecurities, my mental uh, health that I really need to fix and to uh, really look and confront. So it was, it, was, it definitely led me towards that. Thanks for sharing. Um, I, your, your documentary talks and addresses a lot of the challenges you've been through as a result of being Asian and being othered as a result. Um, I'm interested in, from the standpoint of adoption, how do, you, how do you feel or how do you think about the role that that has played in your view of the world and how has that changed over time? I definitely think being adopted just intensified what was going on in the real world. And the reason why it intensified because Look, I, I can only speak from being adopted with American parents, and I know Asian parents are very, very different in the way they show love and everything. Uh, but what it was for me and being just around the white community is that you're almost like in this secret exclusive club, I like to call it. You know, you get to sit at the, the table of white people and, you know, you're the token Asian guy and you get to really hear what these kids are thinking and really think about you. You know, and it's, it's usually not the best thing. You know, they would always, like the white kids would always tell me, well, you're not really Asian. You're not one of them. You know, I'm glad you can take this joke lightly. You know, it's, uh, it's not so bad. Like you're tall at least, you know, at least you don't have an accent. That's really what they thought about Asians, you know? And so that's what I really, really believed. Um, and it was just intensified for me, I think, uh, the feeling of like, oh, I can't be like them because they're not cool. They're not attractive. Uh, that's what white people make fun of. So then I got to do the opposite, you know, do, do what white people do. So that's what I did. And I think that gets more intensified more because I'm around it. And there's this like thing where I can't see that I'm Asian, you know, but like I just see a bunch of white Caucasians around me. And then, you know, here I am doing these self-hatred things, you know, and then I look in the mirror, I'm like, hmm, something doesn't feel right. Let me just keep doing it, you know? And I think that's where it happens, where at least like with an Asian family, you get people to identify with and hopefully you have role models in your family, you know, like your dad or your mom, where it's like, my dad was a good role model, but because he didn't look like me, I didn't have an actual role model until later on in my life. Like literally, you know, until later on in my life. I think actually I have another question to go off of what you just said. Sure. So growing up, I also grew up in the Midwest and I, there was literally no other Asian people and I never saw role models on TV. And I think we had this discussion a year ago when, when Henry Golding came. And the question is, would that movie have been as successful if the male lead was full Asian versus half Asian? So we had talked about this very briefly before the talk. So can you share your thoughts? Yeah, so I actually, I thought there was a great opportunity for Crazy Rich Asians to put a full Asian uh, male lead in this movie uh, because it was going to be a success. There was huge hype about it before. What I, I'll just get the elephant out of the room. A lot of people are afraid to talk about this subject because 
They're afraid of stepping on the toes or upsetting the successful half Asian, half white male leads right now. The thing that I have a problem with, and it's an open discussion more than anything, is the fact that now for Asian male leads to blend in Hollywood and media, it seems like you have to have a little white in you. And there's the thing where the hapas, that's what Koreans call half Asians, half whites, say, well, you know, we're not accepted by the Asian community because we're this and that. And I'm like, actually, no, you're really celebrated. It's just that for, for me, I want, to, I want to say, like, you could help. You could acknowledge the white privilege that you actually have. You have a little bit in you, you know? And that will also help you blend in with what Hollywood and media wants, which is you, you don't look Asian, you could be white, so let's just place you whatever we like. But a full Asian person won't, doesn't have that privilege. And so the acknowledgement of, yes, white privilege still does happen in, in Hollywood and media, being even half Asian, will help a lot because I think a lot of these execs in Hollywood and all these people casting only half Asians as the full lead, they just say, okay, that's good enough. We got it, you know? What are they complaining about? We got a full Asian, you know? They can't even tell the difference, apparently. And it's like, no, we can. I can clearly tell Henry Golding is not full Asian, you know? And if that's what your perception of a full Asian looks like then, then okay, I'm kind of screwed, you know? And so are other Asians. So I'm not saying that like, I think it's a good start, obviously. Did a great job in the movie. But I was gonna say like every single lead that we now see is half Asian or even more white actually than anything. And that's what's been happening in the movies and the leads. So that's where I say it's like, you just gotta acknowledge it because if you don't acknowledge that that's a problem too, that we're only casting half Asians, half whites, then it's never gonna be solved either. And that's where I'm not trying to hate on them for congratulations, it's awesome, you know? But we're, we need this too, you know? So like, it needs to be spoken out loud by the half Asian, half, half white leads that are out there now but they don't seem to really talk about it. They want to play like, oh, I'm the full Asian guy that was discriminated all the time, blah, 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 blah. You go to Asia, you're going to be worshipped. Let's just say that. Like, and that's another thing. I was in Asia for a long time doing entertainment and modeling, and they made it very clear that if you were half Asian, you have such an exponentially higher chance and you'll get more money and opportunity than a full Asian ever would, even if he was born in America. Um, and speaks perfect English. It's just a fact. So that's where it's just like, okay, acknowledge that. That's all we're saying. It's just acknowledge that that that's there, you know? Thank you for your honesty on this topic. Yeah, I have more honesty on other topics. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, I saw another audience question and then we can go to the door. Thank you for your time for coming here. Uh, so uh, I had a question. So I'm actually from Philadelphia. That's my hometown too. Yeah, you so go. really repping. Um, yeah. And... So I obviously have to watch your your documentary. Yo, um, still didn't watch it. <laughs> so this question might be repetitive for people who already watched it. Um, but did you go to New York first and then you went to Philadelphia, or? Uh, so uh, I was in Philadelphia where my family was adopted, and then I went to New York for five years to pursue a modeling and acting career, and then Southeast Asia for a year, and then came back to New York, and then ended back in Philadelphia thinking after the skateboard trip and hoping that I'd land back in Los Angeles to do more acting, but I ended up staying there for about four, four years, three and a half, four years, getting my life back together. Okay, so just, you, did you do your schooling, you said? It, oh, my college education? Yeah, that was, that was in Philadelphia as well. I went to Temple University. Oh, same. Woo! Woo! Owls. <laughs> okay. If you graduated uh -huh. within the last five years, you're much smarter than me. Back then, it was easy to get into. <laughs> now it's super hard. So, um, and I had a more general question too. What's your experience like as an Asian in, say, the East Coast versus the West Coast? Because I also Good moved question. here from uh, East Coast to West Coast just for the How job. recently? Um, almost a year now, not Me yet. Me too, okay, so yeah, I've, been, I've spent about a year here now. It's huge, it's massively a huge difference from the West Coast to the East Coast. Uh, for instance, East Coast are more active and um, they're more blunt about these types of things. And the West Coast, it seems like we kind of dance around the subject a little bit, but we don't really talk about it, right? So my thing is, people are more laid back about here. 
But I also don't know if it was as intensified because there are more Asians out here. It's easier to find a community. But I also get a little confused because all the racism and the prejudice and all the stereotypes came from here. Wouldn't you be more active in it, I thought, you know, because all the Hollywood content comes from here, right? A little bit from the East Coast, but we talk about it, you know, and they're a little bit harsher <laughs> on the East Coast. It kind of hurt a little bit that they have to work on that. I'm not saying that. But on the West Coast, it's kind of like, man, you know, um, dating on the East Coast, from my experience, really sucks compared to the West Coast. I'm being serious. Like, I just find the West Coast such more laid back, like, when it comes to, like, just wanting to meet up or date or, like, standards of dating are a little bit different, you know? And it's just, like, um, I told a lot of people from the East Coast, I'm like, I think I got a little bit of boost of self-esteem <laughs> moving out here with dating because it's, like, man, it's just such a different way of living, you know? And people are, like, healthy and vibrant, you know? Um, East Coast, you know, kind of seems like it's snowing all the time, you know? So, I'll go. I love the East Coast. I'm just saying that it's just very different vibe dating over there and stuff. Yeah. Regarding the Ugly Model documentary, is your goal to challenge the current beauty standards to include Asian American men or to reject them due to the basis upon which they were formed? Rejection! No, I'm kidding. <laughs> it's good for the spirit. Uh, no, obviously it's to include Asian men. Absolutely, 100% to include Asian men. It's the only reason why I agreed to do something like this because like Brian Yang said in the documentary, to see an Asian guy who's like a hunk or the male lead, it's a shock to the system, right? So the two, direct, uh, the director and the producer who are Asian women did a good job at that, I thought, you know? I and mean, I thought it was a great way to show that an Asian guy is like a regular human being. Yes, there might be some stereotypes, like I like sushi, you know, like all that stuff. Well, I'm vegetarian now. Ugh. So, but anyway, don't hate me for that. But it's, um, it's, it's just showing the whole spectrum of being a human, not just Asian, you know, and, he, and I am Asian. Obviously you can tell there's no hiding it, but I just do like regular fun human stuff. You know, I'm just being myself. So uh, it's definitely to include Asian, Men. I mean, that's all I want to do is freaking take every one of you and just, you know, definitely want to include that because I know what it feels like to be excluded and it doesn't feel good. I know what it feels like to not belong. It doesn't feel good, you know, so my, my goal is to make this an inclusive movie for us. Uh, why do we have to redefine masculinity? I am also an Asian male. Not myself. It's from the door. I am also. So say you don't look like. Clarifying. And I also do like sushi, though. So. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'm also an Asian male, and the challenges that definitely resulted are the definitely resulted in the most personal success in the dating realm was to conform myself first through playing football, and then later through bodybuilding. Instead of trying to say beauty standards should change. I feel like I wrote that question. <laughs> It's exactly what I did. Um, so why we need to redefine masculinity, especially Asian masculinity, is because the, for me, right, masculinity has been a big topic. And the fact is a lot of us have, uh, we need to evolve as men, right? As Asian men, especially. I think the key word is evolve. Who you were five years ago, I hate the sound of this. Yes, you were whole, perfect, and complete then, right? Like as all these yogis like to say. But if you stay exactly the same and you don't evolve to become better, you're gonna be an inferior version of yourself then. You just are. I think the evolving of Asian masculinity is this. We need to get deep down with our own insecurities. We don't want to talk about insecurities. We only want to talk about our victories. We want to talk about our, our uh, career position, our status. We want to talk about what clothes we're wearing, all to make us feel better about ourselves, right? We need to start talking really like a human being, not as, not as opponents, but like as a teammate even, right? And we need to get deep down, and I'm going to say it, you can cringe if you want to, we need to work on self-love. That needs to be redefined. Self-love is not just for women. It's for everybody. It wasn't until I actually started to practice self-love and be like, ugh, okay, this feels good. 
that everything started to get better for me. You need to practice self-love, you know? You need to practice vulnerability, whatever that means to you, right? Whether it means like sharing your deepest, darkest secrets with somebody, connecting with other people, sharing your real life stuff, because I hear a lot of like, I'm not trying to say it's jargon, but I think a lot of people, especially men, just try to be like, yeah, macho, like look at all these things that I'm doing, you know? Like it's like a freaking race or like an award system. And it's like, that's what's disconnecting us as Asian men. It's like this whole idea that like, maybe there can only be one Asian person in, in the CEO position. I guess there is only one CEO, right? But, like, but you know what I mean? On the world, there can only be one Asian male CEO and like, uh, there can only be one Asian male lead or a model or blah, 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 blah. You know, we need to be able to like, not just collaborate with each other, but also too, man, you gotta, you gotta work on yourself too. This. I'm huge on self-improvement and improving yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, not just career, because it'll help you with your career too, but also too, it just makes you a better person, better, better human being. So I, I just believe that it's so important to redefine Asian masculinity because we have an opportunity here to actually be better than the people that hated on us before, that brought us down. Because I think being Asian is gonna be super cool soon. I mean, it already is, but it's going to kind of be like superheroes, you know, like everybody made fun of me when I was a little kid for liking superheroes. Everybody made fun of me for being Asian. Now superheroes are amazing. Everybody's watching it, right? Soon everybody's going to want to be Asian like that guy, you know, he's trying to pretend to be Asian, you know, that's that question. We know you got FOMO, you want to be Asian, you know, but it's like that it'll happen. It's just that we have an opportunity to really make a great impact by being an evolved version of what I feel like a man should be, which is caring, loving, compassionate, vulnerable, more sensitive. You know, you don't have to cry when you see a sunset, you know, but it's just like be more sensitive and value the things that really matter. At what point in your journey did you really think about self-love? Did you start embracing that concept in your life? Yeah, the part of my journey actually was getting sober. It was about four years ago. Uh, I didn't really know what it was, you know, um, like I really thought self-love was still like uh, collecting, you know, the nicest jewelry or uh, having amazing Bali trips all the time, you know, or having a, having like a, like lots of partying nights out, you know, like I hate to sound like this, but like every time I got super wasted and did all these fun things that we consider like self-love and care, YOLO, right? was actually harming me and it was destroying my soul inside you know obviously I think everything in moderation but our version of moderation isn't very moderate in America right we're the country of more so I really discovered self-love when I could just cut out all that stuff get help from other people and then start to really discover like what are my real thoughts whether they're ugly or not what are my real insecurities they're pretty freaking ugly you know and where am I not being honest with myself where do I have to clean up my past, you know, because I used to hurt a lot of people back then, you know, emo emotionally, not not physically, but emotionally and mentally, you know. So what do I have to do to clean that stuff up? And then what am I going to do to get back to my community or get back to people? So that I feel like was an act of self-love for me, you know, because when I gave, I also got something in return. So that was an act of self-love for me. So speaking of community and lifting each other up, you just mentioned that there's a perception that there's only one Asian CEO, one Asian model, only yeah. one role. So how does that play out in the grand scheme of things? Yeah. So obviously you want to love yourself, but how do you also build this community where everyone's actually lifting each other up when we, re when we see with our own eyes that there really only are X number of spots? Right. So I call it the token Asian syndrome. You know, there can only be one. Uh, some people call it the Highlander, which is they're going to be one at the table. Uh, I actually feel like that's that's just something that has to be busted down. Uh, there are lots of Asian people in, empowered right now who can also help out and who have who have freely given opportunity to the Asian community. I just feel like we need more people like that. And there are people at the top who can do that. And Hopefully they'll hear this message and be like, yeah, I should do that. There's nothing wrong with looking at two candidates and being like, oh man, I like that guy. Uh, he's Asian. 
Actually, I'm going to hire him. You know what I mean? And you're Asian. There's nothing wrong with that. Look, we all have those thoughts. We know what's going on here. White people have been doing it forever. You know? <laughs> like, I hate to sound like that, but like, you're no different. But what I'm saying is you're giving an opportunity for the next generation. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that. So my thing is there's actually a sense of feeling special too that people don't talk about. Being the only Asian that's the CEO of here and not letting another person in, that comes from insecurity as well. Mm -hmm. And we need to actually have more humility to realize that, that, that we're actually not giving other Asians opportunity from deep set of insecurity, feeling we're not gonna be special, feeling our positions are gonna be taken away. Your position will be taken away if you suck at your job. Doesn't matter what race you are. It's definitely not gonna happen because another Asian person is there and they're good at your job. You just gotta be better still, you know? There's nothing wrong with that. So I would just say like, yeah, it takes, it takes a lot of self-awareness to realize like, hey man, I just, I really do just wanna be the only Asian up here because it makes me feel good. That sucks, but if you can be aware of that, we can change that. Uh, thank you for being here. Uh, so you mentioned at the start of your talk about like, I want to talk about comparing two separate films with Asian male leads. Like, uh, there's Crazy Rich Asians, which had which had Henry Golding, and then there's Always Be My Maybe, which also had Asian leads. Now, Crazy Rich Asians focused a lot on like Asian culture and how like it was like front and center, like the big Asian family with all of their like with all of the quirks and idiosyncrasies that are normally associated with like. Asian culture, whereas mm -hmm. Always Be My Maybe was basically just like, they could, they were basically just like drop-ins for like, uh, you, you know, it was basically just like a standard American experience and there was nothing overwhelmingly representative of Asian culture in that movie. So that- Which movie was that? Always Be My Maybe. Always Be My, okay. Yeah. Right. Yeah. So you know how it, it may as well have just been two white people living in San Francisco and it could have been their love story except that they were Asian. So how do you compare and contrast the values of like these two very different types of things where it's like, oh, Asian people are just like you mm -hmm. versus, oh, the, these are all like the many- things about Asian cultures that are different and those also need to be celebrated. So, Right. Well, first, that's, I'm glad you brought that up because obviously, even though I share about like, we need to see more Asian men and stories, whatever, we know it's not going to happen all in one movie. You know, that's a very long movie if we're going to include all of our cultures and history and stuff. But I would say this too, my personal experience is that... Um, a lot of Asians, I'll say, I'll say something that might piss people off. Actually, get ready for it. We're too racist against each other. We're just flat out racist. My culture, my race is better because I'm Japanese, blah, blah, blah. We're this and that. We should be celebrating each other's cultures. I mean, I don't really have a favorite Asian culture, to tell you the truth. I love all of it. I fucking love Vietnamese culture, Korean. I'm really getting deep dived in. Uh, Chinese culture, I probably know that the most, and I'm no Chinese at all, actually. You know, I just found out, you know, through my genetic test. Like, I love Japanese, like American, whatever. But my thing is, like, I like to celebrate all of it. We're not going to be able to do that all in one movie, and it's not going to be totally clear without trial and error, right? It's so new what we're doing. My thing is, I'm going to be patient with these movies coming out because we're not going to get it done on the first movie. The thing is, we got to keep working on getting better. I mean, if you would have heard the first time I talked and spoke about Asian identity 10 years ago, you'd be like, I'm not listening to this guy. He's got it all wrong, you know? But like, I kept doing it and I kept getting better. I kept getting more clarity. I kept getting more insight, listening to feedback, right? I think what you're saying is super important so we can get feedback to make other stuff better. Without it, nothing gets better. And so I think that's another thing that Asian community needs to do just listen to feedback, man. Like, listen to it. Take what you want. But, like, literally, some a lot of the feedback's good. It'll make you better, you know? I mean, sometimes we take it so personally. Like, oh, my God, they think I suck, right? It's like, no, it just means you can work better on something. There was something missing, right? So you have a voice. Share it. Share your, share your opinion or, like, whatever. Talk to people about it. Uh, but also be part of the solution in that sense, right? Be constructive. What I mean by constructive, like, which we were doing, 
it's not like saying, man, always be my maid, it sucks. What are they going to do with that? You know, there's nothing they can act upon that, you know, give some constructive feedback. There's parts here, whatever there. I would like to see more representation there. What is it? And that's where I say like, you know, hey, I'd like to see more Asian male leads, full Asian male leads and things not throwing karate chops, you know, love to see that. That's what constructive criticism I have, because it's like something that's missing that you can work on, you know. I don't know if that answers your question. I mean, not specifically. I was just wondering about what. The... <laughs> what? Sorry. My, my main question was like, how does the value of these two different types of films with Asian male leads differ? Oh, so it's yeah. great because, yeah, you get all types of uh, humans in it, right? Because not everybody is typically hunky. Right. And 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 uh, gets gets the girl at the end. What I loved about um, uh, Always Be My Maybe is that it, it was like almost reversal. Right. Like the aggressive female going after the Asian guy who's kind of dorky and doesn't really know what he's going to do. That stuff really happens, you know. So like sharing that story to see the two contrasts is amazing. You know, he came from a poor family. Well, it wasn't that poor, but it's like compared to other family and crazy rich Asians you know those people do exist by the way you know they're telling their story so it's great to see that contrast so we're not forming this solid stereotype that oh my god all Asians have British accents <laughs> you know like <laughs> so it's good to see the contrast of like yo this is a cool guy who raps you know does this stuff and it's cool like it's fun they're making it fun too you know that's what the best part is and so you need to see the contrast and that's why i think so important and it's good to see that do you agree yeah many different stories many different voices Thank you for the question. Um, unfortunately, we're at time today, so I want to give a huge shout out to Talks at Google and Asian yeah. Google Network. Thank, thank you, you so much. Yeah. And of course, most importantly, thank you so much, Kevin, for coming and joining us and sharing all your. Wop louder. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding.